Cool. All right. I'm, a, I'm really excited. You know, I, I'm really excited to talk to you. And uh, first Same of here. all, I just want to say thank you for uh, coming on. And but mostly, man, I just want to say, you know, thank you for being uh, an inspiration because uh, like you are a leading voice in AI. And looking back, you know, you're you've taken really courageous moves, like even looking back to, you know, your master's degree, taking your own decision to uh, sort of take your own path. Right. That must have been you know, a big move at the time. And then uh, doing YouTube, also a really courageous move. Uh, joining DeepMind and now, you know, really exciting for you uh, doing your own startup with uh, Ordis. So, you know, there's a lot of things we can talk about. And I think uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, you, you say courageous moves, but for me, like all of those were very natural. And like, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Like back when I was doing masters, um, like it was super boring and I felt I'm not learning enough. And so for me personally, like given my work ethic and everything I do and who I am, like just self-awareness, like that was the most natural step, just quit, quit the masters and start doing my own thing. Like, so I, I, I think that same pattern kind of repeats over and over again. And it all just hinges on the, on the, on the fact that like, I know who I'm, who I, who I am and like, what's the, what's the best way for me to learn stuff. And then everything else kind of fits, fits in. But yeah, thanks yeah. for the kind kind words. Yeah, I guess I mean, you're also a YouTuber, so so that's also courageous, courageous as you said, as you said. But yeah, <laughs> like like there's you know there's a going against what all the other like other people are doing, uh, and I'm at the time you know doing that. There must have been people who said you know why are you doing that and being sticking to your own voice that you have and sort of you saying it. Well, I can learn more by doing this instead, and I really want to do that and sort of listening to that rather than what other people are saying. That's what I view oh. as, you know, courageous. Yeah, 100%. Like, I guess, first of all, like my parents, like back then I was still living with, with my parents, like me trying to leave the masters for them was like the biggest catastrophe ever. Yeah, and they yeah, were They were doubting me, even though, even though like I already showed, I already had back then track record of doing stuff, but like even, even then they were doubting me. And the worst thing is when I was at Microsoft, like, for almost three years, which is like way bigger bar, like higher bar than just like wrapping up your masters in Belgrade. And when I was trying to, when I was telling them, hey, I want to leave Microsoft and 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 go to this different company, DeepMind, they were still doubting me. They were like, no, don't do that. Like fin finish masters. So it's like, yeah, th there's always going to be these uh, like people, including your parents who, who have yeah. sometimes the best intentions, but like, it's just, there is also like a, a gap in understanding and, and familiarity with with the whole context and, and and given how fast ai is moving like it's it's hard for even for us to 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 like to to keep up to date so i'm definitely not blaming blaming my parents but like yeah yeah i i hear you how do you do how do you deal with that when people you know you get that doubt from you know family or friends or you know as you know too on youtube uh, and, you know, how do you deal with that sort of getting that, uh, I wouldn't say like criticism, but just, you know, the nat natural doubt when you're taking your own way, doing something different, people are naturally gonna, uh, be a little skeptical of, of that decision. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, I guess I don't really listen. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a TLDR. Like, I don't know, like I I'm joking. Uh, I'm semi joking. Like, of course you, you, you do want to like keep an open mind and, and, and hear feedback because sometimes that feedback is going to make sense. But oftentimes just because my path was so unique and I was really the only person who knew what I'm doing. Like maybe now my girlfriend knows a bit more because like she, she knows a lot of stuff, but like it's still up to me to decide and, and maybe just like, I guess the best thing you can do is, is be very eloquent and communicate to your parents and to your environment, what you want to do and hope they will understand. You, you, you will never be able to like get everyone on the same page, but I guess if you have the conviction, you're determined and you just communicate that and expect some support, that's everything you can do really. Right. Yeah, I agree. For me, you know, I've always tried to think, you know, what am I, uh, like, what am, what is it I'm trying to do and looking at the intentions of things. So like for YouTube, for example, like I'm trying to share ideas that have, you know, from what I've learned and see if it can be helpful to other people. 
And that, you know, to me, that's a good intention. And then there's, if things go wrong, you had the, you had a good intention and you can reevaluate, you can analyze it again, and you can make better decisions. Like mistakes will happen, but you know, if, if you are listening to that, then I think that's a, a good uh, indicator. And then also just being, uh, becoming comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, mm-hmm. cause things are like chaotic and just being okay with not knowing sometimes. 100%, 100%, especially now, like when, when I literally like, like I, I left deep mind and, and I'm not going back to corporations, which is for most people, it's just like very comfortable. The so-called, like if you have the so-called golden handcuffs, everything's cool. If you have amazing salary, cool environment, everything is set up and then going into the unknown, I, I guess starting a startup is the ultimate going into the not unknown. Like I, I, I do have, like because of the community I build and, and some track record, it's a bit easier for me to maybe raise money and, and stuff like that. But still there is zero guarantees that just because you were an A player in something in your previous life, that doesn't guarantee you'll be an A player in, in, in building your own company. So like, I, I think this, this is one of those moments in my life where like I'm going completely into the unknown. The, 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 the previous, maybe the, the, the biggest such event previously was when I left masters, when I dropped out in order to focus on something that was still not there. So I, I kind of left and didn't focus on it and then started learning algorithms and data structures and everything you need to land a job as a software engineer in big tech. And there were really no guarantees. And so, but I think now it's even, it's even worse. Like it's very, very open-ended, but I mean, it's still, it's not like I, I can always go back and, 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 and work at a company. Like the worst thing that can happen is I'll learn a bunch like I'll get to know so many interesting people. I'll see how the how the whole startup like life and 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 environment looks like. And then going back, like you 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 would you would only have something to add on top of everything you you learned previously. So I so I never really I don't know like I internally I don't really fear or have any such like also financially I, I guess over the previous years I've been working at big tech so I'm I'm, I'm have some safety net. So like. For me, this was the most natural. Actually, I think it would be more risky for me not to do this now, if that makes sense. So that's how I think about it. Yeah, and you'll all like you'll be wondering, you know, this is what I want to do, and then if you don't take that decision to try it, you'll be wondering, you know, what happened if I took that path? Because as you said, you've been working at a larger company, and you have that sort of uh, structure around you. You have great people, you have great salary, and sort exactly. of everything is uh, well structured. And now again, I would say that you're moving into unknown territory and that, that, you know, is inspiring. So maybe how has that been for you to like go now into the startup? What would you say is like the difference, uh, first working at a big company, how has that been for you? And then now, uh, at a startup, it's completely different. Like, especially when you work at the big tech and especially Google, like, I think Google had like suffers even more from, from that, like um lock into the internal tooling at microsoft i could install like on my local like pc i could install whatever like why like uh what's the name of the id i forgot i didn't use it in a while pyterm yeah pyterm yeah. or whatever you want really whereas in google you, you really have strict policies on what you can install and everything is run on cloud so so i think that's one of the biggest differences you really have to use and relearn some stuff for example you cannot use git or versioning, you have to use internal fig. Like th- there is so many such details. And um, obviously when you start like working at your own startup, you, you, you have to, to think which tools you have to pick and you don't have that type of support. Like you don't have all of the coworkers and, and internal channels like Slack channels to just ping somebody and get, get help. Again, for me, because I'm in a like kind of privileged position because of the community, I, I can actually reach out to many people and ask for help, but um, those are some of the differences. And then of course you don't have, um, you don't have like a regular salary. Everything is much more like volatile there. Um, what else you really choose everything you want to work on. There is no one, there is no manager. I, I and that's probably the most important one. Like for, for me, like personally, I, I, since I started my first day at Microsoft, I knew I always had a goal of starting my own startup. And I actually, before I started working at a company, I had a timeout, like a sort of a timeout for me. Like I, I knew I don't want to stay more than like two years. 
for Microsoft, that, that turned out to be almost three years because of pandemic, kind of like unexpected um, event, obviously. And for DeepMind, it was the same thing. Before I started working there, I knew I, I don't want to stay more than a year and a half and two, or two years. And for many people, that's unbelievable. Like, why wouldn't you stay there for like for your whole life? But like, again, going back to self-awareness, like I wanted to get the knowledge, have some impact, contribute, learn, get the network, get all of that, and then step out and go on to do my, my own thing. Because ultimately, like it might seem selfish, but ultimately it's not because that's the way I think I can maximize my impact. By being in a corporation, oftentimes like in Google and Microsoft I experience this, like unless you've been there for many years and you're on a, like a way higher level of seniority, uh, you don't really have that much. You have some flexibility, but it's nowhere near comparable to what you can have if you're doing your own stuff, your projects. And for me, like having this, always having something that I do on site, like uh, YouTube, et cetera, and projects, I, I felt that freedom and that was always bothering me because like I, I knew that when I wrap up my daily job, I can go and do whatever I want. Whereas on the daily job, there's some stuff I have to do because my manager told me or because there's some business expectations. So all of that combined kind of paints the picture of, of what's different between being at a big tech and, and, and being like a entrepreneur, I guess. Yeah, 100%. Like the, the big thing of having impact, it seems like you can have a lot more doing your own thing and creating because you're like you are, you're doing, you're having impact working at Google, right? But it's, uh, you're part yeah. of a big, big system. And so, but, but the, the thing with impact at Google is first, you don't feel it, right? Like, and same yeah. for any big tech, like you can just replace Google with whatever big tech because you are really tucked in deeply inside this huge corporate machine. And somebody tells you that, hey, the thing you built in some product, like there is no way you can directly measure how much of an impact you had. It's all it's all kind of dark magic and, and, and po like politics inside of the company and how you discuss and communicate stuff with your managers, with, with your teammates. So it's all a bit of a, like dark magic, even though they always try to wrap it up, like that's everything is quantifiable, like all the, the like the, the promotions and stuff, but it's it, it never is. And so... And so you don't really feel the, the same impact. And again, going back to my YouTube, like the thing is there, I had a literally there, and you know this as well as I do, like you have direct impact on, on, on a, so many people and you get direct feedback from them via DMs on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on emails, telling you stories, how they, how you help them uh, land a job, uh, like uh, enroll in some faculty or whatnot. Actually, when I was working at DeepMind, I had over, I think almost 20 people, if not more, of deep minders who freshly arrived, who told me that because of my blog and, and uh, the videos and the resources I made that helped them land the job there. So I think that's amazing. I, I, I feel I literally had more impact by doing all of that than in my like internal role. And that, that, that kind of is weird. So that, yeah. that was one of the reasons why I never, I knew I never want to stay too long. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear you like the, the impact you can have just for me, just doing YouTube, I feel is much like on a net scale, I would say is much greater than me working at a big company, but there's the, uh, there's the, you know, well-being comfort aspect of it. Working yeah. at a big company is much more comfortable. You have like a stable salary, you have stable, uh, everything is stable, right? Doing YouTube and all of these things are more chaotic. So you really have to balance it. It seems like you've yeah. done a great job. Like, working at the big company, you get that experience and you get that perspective. You also get some safety net and then you uh, venture to do your own thing. I think yeah. that's a great, yeah. uh, and, and also, as you said, like now you can probably, even though you still have that, uh, chaotic feeling, you have that, uh, that freedom aspect, which you didn't have before. And that probably is amazing, right? You can yeah. eat before you couldn't even install your own code editor. Now you can use whatever you want and sort of you're the leader taking the decisions, you know, what should be, what, what products should, or what services should be used uh, and so on. I'm really excited to get into that because, you know, uh, I've been trying out orders by the way, and you, you, um, you have the, like the, the most popular channels that I listen to that are like really lengthy. And, uh, so like yeah. Lex Friedman, Huberman and so on. And for me, it's really amazing to go to just like, okay, I want to check this episode. And just go to the uh, the chapter uh, summaries and just see like, okay, what are the divisions? What did they talk about here? And that actually saves a lot of time just checking, okay, this is what I actually want to listen to. And nice. then yep. 
if there's anything specific to that, I can go, you know, you also have like the really nice UI, like everything mm -hmm. is on, like, on the, like on the outside, it looks really like simple and really nice. Like it, it just works well. But underneath, there's probably a lot <laughs> that we can get yeah, into. There, like, there is a ton. There is a ton. I yeah. always get surprised. And, and historically, I, I was always getting surprised by like, hey, what, what are those guys at YouTube doing before I even joined like DeepMind? Like, like you, you just see this. The thing is, most people just see the UI. And like there, there is just so much going on, like on, on the backend side and, and also like tracking and everything you're doing. Like we are collecting feedback. Uh, like we, we there, there, there is just so much going on behind the scenes, of course. And also the whole logic behind the, um, when you type in something and, and ask a question, obviously there is a lot of going on in the background, like um, with, it, it's an LLM application. There is a lot of LLM calls, uh, chaining uh, to use the, the technical terminology. So, 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 so yeah, uh, it's super exciting. So what we are really trying to do, uh, if you, if you want to get into that, like with Ortis is like, we want to reinvent how people watch videos because so far people are just very passive. When you're watching videos, you just sit down and like passively absorb information. And we know from multiple studies that by being proactive, asking questions, thinking, writing notes, etc., you will learn faster and you will learn more efficiently. And so like what you get with Ortis is first of all, you, you get these episode level summaries. So you, you, you come to an episode that, that's like two hour or, or like eight hours sometimes for Lex Friedman. There was this yeah. episode, I think with Carmack, like almost eight hours. That's crazy. The, the worst thing is I think I watched the whole thing, but end job. <laughs> so, so, so you kind of get the first, the high level uh, summary of the, of the, of the, of the video. Uh, and you can get that through the, through the like bottom panel, or you can simply ask the, the agent and, and it's going to tell you, give you a couple of bullet points. And then you kind of understand what's going on. And then you can start going into the sub sub summaries of the chapters or just asking questions about something that interests you. Like, I don't know, like where do they talk about AGI and the system gives you like a literal timestamp. Of, of where some interesting and relevant conversations are, you get there and you, you can immediately jump into the into the information that that's uh, of interest to you. But like going into the future of how I imagine this also um, playing out a bit is imagining us understanding what you already know and what you want to watch. And like, and instead of treating a video as this monolithic artifact, why not treat it the same as you treat your YouTube home feed, right? Like you have videos and you obviously will not go sequentially through the recommended feed that doesn't make any sense there's billions of videos so the same thing with longer form videos like you why would you go sequentially through everything instead you should just go through the recommended parts given oh. who you are and given what you know potentially you can even skip some parts that you already know and yeah. so, so i was like, about to say i was about to say because that's one of the biggest things that's been useful uh just looking at huberman podcast and so on is actually discarding a lot of information like usually i would listen into you know okay i can use the timestamps uh the like the tags or whatever and i can go you know okay this is what i want to listen to maybe but uh just having that those like summaries and you you get that you feel like you're not missing a lot like you're okay th this is the main bullet points but i don't I, like i'm not interested in that i can just move to this part uh and that way you you don't get the feeling you missed something so you don't have to yep. listen to the whole thing but still you you can go to specifically what you want mm -hmm. uh, but that's a really interesting point so you're like thinking but to me one thing is also like i think uh, how do you see the youtube recommendation system because i feel like there's a lot to be done there as well like the uh, you know the recommendation system they have is built mostly driven by watch time and mm -hmm. that's not maybe conducive to most productive and learning right uh, yeah. uh well the, the whole is we can get into the whole incentives problem because when you set an objective function such as watch time there is a lot of things that emerge right In, interesting behaviors echo chambers this is and this is not specific to youtube like uh, so so definitely i mean youtube feed is not perfect nor is any other feed like uh, pretty much every social um network struggles with this uh, so the, 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 one of the issues I have with YouTube is sometimes when I watch for the whole day, I watch like technical stuff and, and, and machine learning, and then I open up one music video for whatever reason. And all of a sudden my whole feed is like this, this garbage of, of super popular music videos that are completely not curated to what I want to watch. So yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough technical issue. How I imagine this, um, playing out in the future is potentially imagine you like using your language. To, to tell to the recommendation system, hey, today I want to watch physics videos. 
Like, why is everything implicit? I, like, I guess we should have, like, the fallback should be implicit. If people don't want to communicate, they should be fed, like, implicit recommendations based on, on their on their previous uh, watch history, et cetera, et cetera, and all of, all of the signals that, that platforms use. But it, it will be also more empowering and, and, like, it will give you a bigger sense of agency if you have the, 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 the option of just saying, hey, I want to watch this and that. And then the system adjusts mm. to your explicit desire of what you want to watch. So for us, just to make this clear, by the way, like the the Chrome extension is obviously not uh, uh, the end goal. Uh, we are really um, just trying to validate some of hypotheses I, I currently have about what people um, want and 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 how people consume videos. I think there's going to be a lot of there is going to be a learning curve not for our customers, but also for me as well. Like I'm still trying to figure out how to use this the best uh, way possible because sometimes when I watch videos, I just go 2X and then it's hard to stop and ask a question to an agent and, and it feels like a distraction. So I'm, I'm also like, I'm completely transparent here. Like I, I'm, we are still in the phase where we're just exploring and, 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 and trying and like just doing interesting stuff and also learning a bunch in the process. I, I learned just so much about the whole prompting and chaining and, and building backends, and I actually built pretty much the whole front end. Um, of course, like my, I have a co-founder. I have my girlfriend, without whom, like the, she, she literally the whole design is is only her credit. Um, but like so I, you're a I team, built, like you and you yeah, and you. We, we're a team. So, so my girlfriend is a product designer. Uh, so all of the everything you see, like the visuals, the the website, uh, is is thanks to her. There is of course some some internal discussions, but she is pretty much the, the accountable, the main person for that part. Uh, I also have a co-founder. He currently works full time at his own startup, so he cannot currently invest as much time as I can. But he's definitely super helpful, and um, he helped with stuff like, uh, for example, like the streaming you see, because by default you'll just get you'll just wait a bunch, and then you'll get a message. Yeah. The streaming yeah. part was actually more difficult again than it seems because there is just so many errors you have to handle, uh, and the API that that um, OpenAI offers is not really that robust. So like there were there were all of these details that we had to figure out, and also uh, he recently introduced and we we we're going to launch actually just after this podcast I'm going to announce um, the Notion integration so you'll be able to just click uh, well so so as you, as you know how that you can maybe put up the image of the of the of the widget but like you have the upper panel and the and the lower panel and you'll just have a small Notion icon where you can just export directly to a, to a page you you want. Uh, that information, like either summary of the episode or chapters or the message of, of, uh, from the agent that you particularly loved, completely with the URLs and timestamps. So I think uh, some people might find that useful. Again, that's something that we are trying to test. But like, yeah, that, that's something that, that the co-founder helped a lot as well. So we are a team and, and we also, um, again, because of the position I'm in, a lot of very cool, smart people are reaching out. And so we just started collaborating with, with, with one very smart guy who is uh, ex-Microsoft. And he's um, basically working with us on, on um, optimizing the inference uh, for for Whisper. Uh, obviously, we're using uh, transcription in the background, so uh, and so there is very interesting collaboration going on with him. And I'm just like also uh, talking with a lot of people and, and seeing how we can col collaborate and just have some types of projects that are maybe open sourced or or just like a public that we can use to to collaborate with new people and use that also as a as a funnel to find the best people and, and, and get them in. So, yeah. How does, uh, can you give a brief like overview of, of like how it works technically? The, like, the system? Yeah. 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 So on, on the high level, so we, we obviously transcribe, uh, like that, that's one of the reasons why we cannot really support every every video on youtube is some of the other tools is because they just use auto generated uh transcripts right uh, so it's I, lower so I guess, lower quality than whispers i guess way lower quality and okay. also we we we're experimenting with multimodal aspects as well um currently we are we're mostly we are we are gearing towards text but like we are experimenting with vision as well so um historically back at DeepMind, i used to work on vision language models so this is something that's very close and dear to my heart um so again, so the the summaries part works by um, again, it's, it's just going to be some large language mo model call, uh, maybe some map, map reduce in the background just to get those those types of uh, summaries for the chat. Uh, what we do in the background is a fairly complex routing logic um, 
and also trying to infer what the user tried to ask, given the history. So there is a couple of links there to figure out what the user asked and, and, and where to which part of the system we want to route the user to. And then that endpoint then handles the actual question. And we, mm. um, we use various forms of augmentation to, um, to just give a relevant answer depending on, on, on the type of question. Uh, using vector databases and 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 also just um, your classical databases. So yeah, um, obviously I, I can't disclose every single yeah, detail. Yeah, no, that, that's part of our vote. Uh, yeah. In general, I'm, I'm, the thing is like I'm super like and historically I, I've been always up open sourcing stuff, and like I'm very bullish on that. But um, the the more I learn and stuff like. When you want to run a business, ultimately, a lot of people I see in my community just like, hey, can you just open source all of this? And then I'm like, yeah, sure, but you cannot really build any type of business that way, right? Like if your business is based on having an open source repository, and then and that's a common model nowadays in AI, like people build an open source repository like Langchain, and then in the background, they start working on on, on providing like um, like support for, for enterprises or whatnot, where they help them set up the system. And that's that's where the part of the revenue comes. But for us, we currently just because the way we are set up, like that's that's not um, the case, and so yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, just one thing that I just came thought about now that would be interesting as well because you already have the like sh infrastructure for it behind, or maybe maybe it would be difficult. I'm not sure. But like for a lot of videos, you don't even have chapters, right? Like most people, like the good post podcasts have timestamps and so on. But yeah. there's a lot of videos that you know, are just unwatchable because they're like one hour in length yep. and there's no timestamps at all. <laughs> and we're uh, actually handling that as well. We are handling and we are, we oh, are can, uh, if that's even a word, chapterizing, we are, we're adding the chapters for, for videos, even when they don't have it. Oh, uh, really? When they do have the chapters, then we reuse those because we, we assume that the creator of the video has better understanding of the video than, than what we can do with AI. But when there is no, then, then we have some heuristics of how we go about and, and, and do that. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it seems to me like one thing just now, you just like need to scale to like more channels and so on uh, to have for, but but it's how do you plan on doing that? Because like that's, uh, there's a lot of videos out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, as I, as I said, currently um, in the phase that we are in, we are really, that that's not our main point. If the okay. only reason people want to use the tool is because it supports the whole of YouTube, but they don't really love the tool. So we, okay. we'd rather have X number of channels where X is some small number where they, they really engage deeply with, um, with our system and show that, and thus simplicity, they show that they love the system and then scale up rather than just immediately scale up and then get a bunch of, of course, bigger right. numbers, but the engagement is like kind of low. We don't want okay. to go there. Like if we don't find a perfect product market fit and see that people really love this and want to use this, we'll just pivot or, 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 or go to some different part of the idea space. I still okay. love this idea space. I'm very passionate about videos uh, because they're such a complex um, like data object and, and, and um, previously historically without AI, it was very hard to infer and, and get information from the video. So now with, with neural networks, with Whisper, with, with like flamingos of the world, you can now finally uh, analyze what's going on, and so I think, like one of the uh, one of the criteriums when I was starting a business was it has to be as close as possible to the cutting bleeding edge AI, and uh, that that's 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 one of the of the things that went into the idea ideation of 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 this for this. I'm curious also, like how does uh for, like how does a uh, uh creating a startup how do you think about the business aspect because mostly i'm thinking about sort of the technical parts but how mm -hmm. do you uh set up like you need to learn also like how to set up a business model and so on uh what has has your thoughts or sort of ideas been in that in that space I, I think that's a less hard of a problem like if you have a decent amount of a huge amount of people who love your tool, then you don't really have a problem monetizing your product, right? So I, I think that's the main issue for us. We're trying to just find something that people love. Uh, for the business model, there there are like some obvious um, options. One of them is like subscription based. So that means for for some premium features of of, of using the tool, currently the extension, uh, you 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 you, uh, you you have to pay for for like like X number of dollars, like $8 or whatnot per month or something like that. That's one, that's one 
idea. Then uh, we're also some companies started reaching out to us to do the same thing for their internal videos. So um, that that's kind of different uh, part of the market because it's more B2B collaborating with companies and doing that. So we are still not sure whether we want to do that. But again, we are in the early days, so we're just exploring stuff. So company reach, reaches out and they say, hey, I want you to keep on indexing my YouTube videos and also our internal all hands videos, et cetera. We want that type of an insight. Um, can you provide us that? And then we'll we'll create some type of uh, recurring payment scheme or, or, or just like maybe on the, depending on the number of hours or yeah, th those are some things that, that are TBD. But that's that's how we think about it basically for, for now. I really like that the mentality of also starting small, finding quality in that. So like there's a, you know, it's very common to try to diverse too much and then you're doing basically nothing that well, but you're doing a yeah. lot, but to really try to distill and try to locate okay, this uh, or what we're doing now, and let's try to do that really well. So instead yeah. of just scaling uh, directly. That's exactly. A... We, are, we are actually very um, influenced on, 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 on like uh, by the, by the Y Combinator thinking uh, of uh, doing things that don't scale. I think Paul Graham was, I guess, the, the um, original uh, inventor of that approach or whatnot. Uh, but like the idea is uh, a lot of the successful companies uh, like the Airb Airbnbs of the world, Stripes of the world, all of them started with only a couple of users and they were doing a lot of the things manually and and um, made sure to do the things the best way possible. Super high quality, um, uh, the best possible customer service that a big corporation can never provide just because of the scale. Um, and, and then once you find that there are some people who love what you do and what you offer, then you can think about like scaling up and, and, exp and just expanding across various different uh, directions. Yeah. yeah. It's also, uh, let's see, like I wanted to ask about the production side of it, because this is something that I'm not that well versed in, but I, you know, I assume you've learned a lot on that aspect of like how you put these things in production and the difficulty of that, especially, mm -hmm. I feel like, I don't know, maybe you have more insight in this, like, but putting a LLM and things like that can be more challenging than other things, right? You have to have online uh, inference and all of that stuff. It's not some offline batch inference thing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like what has your learning has been putting it into production? Mm -hmm. I, I guess one of the most difficult parts is that you now have to robustly handle the errors. It's not like you can just do something and it hopefully works. If it doesn't work, then, then well, what can you do? Like now you, you have, you really have to handle all of the errors. You have to think about the uptime. You have to think about all of those things. And that kind of changes the way you think about, um, about software. Um, and that's probably the main learning. Um, we are not currently, um, we, we are, um, not hosting our, our own models. So that, that makes it easier. Uh, we are reusing some of the APIs. Um, but like we are, we are doing some fine tuning in the background and, 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 uh, so, so yeah, I guess. Once that moment comes, when uh, when we start hosting our own, own models, that's going to be a bit different. But I think that the problem is, like two years ago, that would be the most logical and probably the only solution you had, right? And and now, I think with all of the foundation models and everything that's going on, you it's questionable whether you want to invest that much time into doing, into fine tuning some open source model that will end up not being nowhere near as good as what, like, for example, OpenAI or Anthropic is offering. And then is it worth, worth the, the hustle? So, so like, the, the field kind of changed a lot over the, over the previous past years. Uh, and um, so my thinking now is, I, I think, actually, that currently software engineers and good web developers have, have, like, a huge advantage compared to many hardcore machine learning folks in the realms of building a business of building a product. If you, unless you're going the, the route of just building the foundation models, then of course, I think that's one of the rare use cases, so, so to speak, where your extensive machine learning background can help you a lot, like just building models from scratch or building tooling for, that helps people fine tune the models. Um, but like other than that, um, for these open ended uh, text based video-based um, applications, it's, it's, it's less obvious where you want to go and, and just 
uh, grab an open, open source model and spend three months collecting data and, and, and fine tuning it. But you definitely, building those muscles is definitely something that you should do in the background. I think it, it's still useful. Yeah, because it seems like the quality to me, just playing around with open source and, you know, compare that to GPT for ChatGPT, like the quality is insanely different. Like yeah. really, it's so much better on the open AI's models that it's hard to compete with it. You know, it's almost like yeah. you, if you want, uh, you know, the highest quality, then you have to use uh, that right now, at least. Exactly. But there's a lot going on there. So it may be keeping an eye on that and seeing, you know, what, no, I don't 100%. know if, how familiar. Yeah. No, again, it just depends on, on the type of, of a space where you're in, right? Like if, if you're doing something like we, where you're literally directly communicating with, with end users, with your AI systems, then you cannot really use the best open source model because it, it's not really comparable, right? But if you're doing some other stuff, like if you're doing some NLP tasks, I don't know, like some text classification or, or whatever, or uh, sentiment analysis, of course, you, you can 100% use open source models for many, many, many applications. I'm, I'm here just coming from a biased, subjective perspective of the thing that we are currently working on. Uh, but like open source is definitely something I'm, I'm super bullish about. And, and we need more uh, people and projects and companies doing, doing open source uh, to compete with some of the top closed source players like OpenAI, Anthropic. What has... Um like the open source debate uh, and the, uh, I don't know how, I've listened to it a bit, like the open AI, uh, what was it? Like the, uh, uh, forget the name, like the hearing, mm -hmm. you know? What, uh -huh. The Senate, uh, Senate hearing. The Senate hearing, yeah. yeah. What, what was your thoughts uh, listening to that? And like the, the, the decision of, you know, even mm -hmm. in EU, like, putting restrictions on, on these technologies. Yeah, that, that's a complicated topic. And I'm not sure I'm the best person to like, I, I don't, I'm not following that space as much as I'm following the capability part of, yeah, of AI. Same. <laughs> um, and, and so I did actually skim through that Senate hearing with Sam Elkman and, and Gary Marcus. Um, so what are my thoughts? I think, I don't know, it's complicated. Um, a lot of the replies were obviously very, very generic corporate because Sam and OpenAI cannot get into trouble. Um, so, so I don't know, like it's probably not as informative as if you were to have chat with those folks behind the scenes. So, so I did, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have a, a good, good opinion there. I think that Europe has historically been over regulating stuff and that has been slowing down progress and, and like putting us at disadvantage compared to some of the state-based companies, especially San Francisco uh, ecosystem has amazing um, like mentality and, and less restrictions. And then on the other hand side, you probably have China, like there is a full spectrum, right? Like where China is, I guess, again, to the best of my understanding, I, may, I might be completely under, there's also a lot of propaganda going on, obviously be, be, between the West and, and China. So like all of our information is kind of coming through the prism and, and, and the filtering of the West. So I'm not 100% confident about everything they say, but like China seems to be collecting data about, about their users and has way less restrictions in that sense. And so, and then because we know that data is name of the game, that, that puts them at an advantage compared to Europeans. And, and, and also increasing the Americans seem to be uh, under more and more regulation. So we'll see how it plays out. The, the, the problem is there is multiple forces at play here, right? On one hand side, because of the health and safety of your citizens and of the whole world, you want some regulations. You you don't want like recklessly this part to, to let this part, these powerful systems to to just like predict whatever they want and, and influence people. But on the other hand side, if you regulate too much, then then you're just like losing the battle. Unless unless everybody's synchronized on the same page and we agree on the same rules, that cannot happen. And I guess that's one of the yeah, that, that's a common. I, I think it's it's called. Is it called the, the the tragedy of the commons? Like, oftentimes for climate change as well. Like, if you were to just go green hundred percent, um, then you might be at a disadvantage compared to some countries which are not doing that, and they're just using everything they've got to increase increase their economic output. So again, it has to be some type of a global collaboration where multiple countries simultaneously agree on something. Other than that, you have this. You're just losing the the the, the whole like market game. So that's why I said it's complicated. There's just so many players, so many incentives, 
and it's very hard to to understand what what people really are trying to do and I, what I are their true one, incentives. I think one thing that has really driv driven this uh, discussion as well is like the risks of AI and uh, people talking about sort of AGI. You know, there's a lot of discussion on that. I think soon, I'm not sure exactly what data was, but I think Jan Lacombe was going to have a discussion about this with uh, Max uh, Tegmark, which is going to be interesting to listen to. But what I'm just curious, you know, what your thoughts are on, you know, the first of all the AGI discussion and then uh, the A AI risks. Yeah. Looking forward. Um, I definitely think I'm, I'm more on the side of Jan Lacombe and and Andrew Ang and those folks definitely more on that side than on Eliza side, um, Eliza Rutkowski. So. The, the, the thing is, there are already so many imminent problems that we are facing with these models. Um, biases, the fact that some of these neural networks are used to in mission critical situations. For example, um, one paper I read a couple of years ago, they stated that the states, they're already using some black box models, I think neural networks, to predict whether some person has a hard chance of, of um, basically um, doing some crime again and thus getting back into the prison and like if you know anything about these systems you know that's not not a good application for current ai systems without like a super high level of supervision from humans uh and i think they they just let those systems loose and they are operating completely autonomously so that's definitely one way bigger problem that not a lot of us have to deal with and that's why we don't really care about it but it's super impacting those people's lives in a significant way already now. Compare that to potential existential risks sometimes in the future. Obviously, the timelines here differ, and the people who are more the AI doomers have way shorter timelines in mind. They believe that, I don't know, like in a year or two, we already have so powerful, such powerful systems that, that we might be at the threat of extinction, which I definitely don't, don't agree with. Just like... We are on an exponential curve. Things are going faster every day. Uh, it's just crazy what happened over the last year and a half. If you just extrapolate into the future and just assume even more breakthroughs are going to like start piling on top of each other, like in five years, we might be able to get to some form of AGI. Again, AGI is a very nebulous concept, depends how you define it. But that still doesn't mean that we'll be in in a threat of an existential existential threat. Like I think it's it's way higher risk that humans will put these AIs into weaponry and then yeah. use that to kill other humans than yeah. AIs going autonomously and wrecking havoc on their own. So yeah. I, I definitely think that we are giving a bit too much agency to these systems and too little agency to humans yeah. uh, in these whole discussions. And it just depends on the weights you put on humans versus AIs here on, on where do you stand. That kind of determines where do you stand on the spectrum of the, being a doomer, doomer, like doomer versus like super high tech optimist. Um, and it's, yeah. Yeah, it seems more likely to me that you would have a really uh, powerful system that you basically humans put the wrong in, uh, objective function into. And then you like, it won't be driven by the AI system. It will be, you know, driven by humans. Yeah, uh, and it's not it, even wrong. It's it's literally malicious. Like, I mean, when when you, when you put an AI model inside of a drone and you, you, you tell it go kill these folks, I mean, it, it's 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 very explicit. So, yeah, I think that those seems are to be my, one, my biggest fears. That seems to be one of the biggest concerns of Joffrey Hinton as well. That's you know what he's had a lot of concerns. Seems like a lot of it has been, uh, you know, military applications and so on. And I'm not too familiar with what exactly that area looks like, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm I just uh, think it's an important discussion just in general. But hundred percent. And there is one more thing. I'm I'm super like I, I'm thinking of, about this a lot. This whole dynamics between West, especially America states, and China, is so weird because Americans just have this. Uh, like very, very American centric, if that's the the, the word uh, worldview. And it's always like China, 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 we have to outcompete China. And I'm like, in this arms race of trying to just outcompete each other, I, I'm not sure, like, I, I don't see any one prominent figure on Twitter mentioning as, as even as a, as a like a high in hindsight, like just collaboration with China, like any any type of 
attempt to to collaborate and and see how we can potentially collaborate together. Instead, it always seems like a competition for Americans. They're always trying to outcompete China, um, and the whole like dynamics that's going on with Nvidia and like China not being able to use some of the GPUs. Like, what happens if China outcompetes us and then they start doing the same thing to the West? Like, I mean. I don't see how this will lead to a stability of the world if we keep on uh, playing this game. Like, of course, that type of competition can can bring a lot of technological improvements, but it's ve it's a very risky game. And so I think in a lot of these conversations, Europeans and and Africans and a lot of other other nations and and con continents, I mean, uh, are are kind of uh, let like they are not really included in these conversations, and it's so it's kind of very biased and and. Uh, towards towards what what a few of, of like San Francisco folks think. Yeah, it's easy to get lost. The bigger picture gets lost, especially when you get fierce competition. You just that becomes your primary goal, and then you might forget. You know what did why did we get into learning about these technologies in the first place? And I definitely agree with you. I'm more on the side of Andrew Ng on that side where. You know this is a an amazing technology that we're learning about. I am super excited every day to just work on this. It doesn't feel like I'm working. This would be what I'm doing anyways. And uh, like to think about what the positive impact we can have just in general with this, uh, it seems so many countries, especially, you know, not only the uh, sort of the Western ones, but just the world seems like it can benefit a lot from this. And uh, I agree with you, like we need to be reminded of that. And so, <laughs> Uh, but it, it, I mean, we can't really impact. Uh, we can just drive technical innovation like we're doing. That's that seems like the the main thing that uh, yeah, and, and, and also hopefully like, the politics. Yeah, I, I mean, it's super helpful to have people talking about safety, ethics, and and doing good work there. Like all all of, actually all of these bigger AI labs, including DeepMind and OpenAI, do have a set of researchers who who do safety and 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 all of that. But we, we definitely need broader society to 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 um, have a word, have a say in in this whole in this whole space. It, it's it's completely a transformative technology. Like there is no doubt about that. Like I I'm I'm not the person who is going to be like some LinkedIn influencer just hyping technology because they will they will get more likes and thus they have direct yeah. incentive to just hype up things. Now yeah. we we are really at a, at a, at, a, at, a, at a position where. Like these powerful language models and, and and increasingly vision language models can solve a lot, like a new classes of problems that we historically could not solve. And like I just I think everything will every piece of software we interact with will get reinvented. Like here is one example: like graphical user interfaces. How often do you find your, yourself trying to find some type of like a setting somewhere in the menu under the nested list yeah, instead of time. just like hey. Just type it in. Like, just yeah. ask the system. Get get a, get an answer. Wow, so yeah. we're again we're going from this O of N search to O of one search in a lot of different areas of life and and, and like interaction with with computers. So I think that's going to change a lot. Also, tools like Copilot from OpenAI. I'm just mind boggled by by how it, it's really help is helping me a lot. Like I'm I'm constantly using it, and sometimes I really don't have to leave my VS Code. So one example yeah. is. When I want to write whatever re, or like regex expression, I just write a comment and I say what I want. I directly get the correct reply. Or when when it uses some function I don't understand, what I do, I, I just literally write a comment. Um, you use this function. What is this function? Like a piece of text, because these models are also trained on, on like text as we yeah. know, not just code. And so I just get a reply directly there. I don't have to even go and do searches on Google or on Google or whatnot. So it's, it's, I'm definitely like compared to a year and a half ago. Like I think I'm doing seventy-five percent of my work using ChatGPT and using Copilot and less and less Stack Overflow and Google. So yeah. a lot of things are changing. Uh, that yeah. that's for sure. And uh, yeah, like GPT four, I didn't use it. I don't know when I started using it, but I can't imagine not using it now. Like I probably use it every day, and it definitely improves my productivity and just a sense of like having. Uh, like a, obviously LMs, you can't trust them completely, right? You have to always be yeah. a little, you know, hesitant, but you, you need to be that in every, you know, even if you Google things, you have to be, have that source criticism, but 100%. just having that, it's amazing just how much knowledge it has about the world.
Like it, it has so much more knowledge than I do. If you just prompt it, it and you can yeah. get yeah. Th these insights from it. It's uh, it's it's amazing. You know, it's yeah. uh, no. really transformative. Hundred percent. We have to be very attentive when we're using these models. I had a couple of situations where it gave me just a very a slightly different function name that did not exist, and I'm like, oh, it just reused my function from the different file because Copilot. If you saw that blog where a guy dissected how Copilot works, it actually takes context from the file and also like surrounding files. And I was like, ah, seems like a good function. And then something's not working here. And then I realized, okay, I just like I didn't check this. Uh, I was not thorough enough. So that will happen. But again. Mistakes always happen in software. There is no such a thing as bug-free code, as we know. And um, and like this, these tools, especially for some um, pattern matching types of assignments, they are very robust. For copy pasting, for doing something where you literally, I don't know, you have to create some contents, uh, some constants with that are repetitive. You just give it one example, two examples, and then for the rest of twenty examples, you, you would have to type in yourself. You just get like. 18 like completes and and you just saved yourself a huge amount of time so for those tasks and those tasks are actually uh like take i guess a significant percentage of of building any any uh software system so that means it it really saves you significant uh, amounts of time like it's it's not over, like it's not exaggeration to say such a thing yeah what, what would you like do you would you put a percentage on like how much productive you are using Copilot and GPT? Uh, I'm so? reluctant to do that. Like the the whole 10x engineer and all of that. Like I, I'm 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 not in that mood. Uh, but like it, it's very it's a function of the type of code and type of language and it's it's very contextual, right? Like it depends on the type of a, a problem I'm currently solving. Is it front end? Is it Python? Is it JavaScript? Um, I think for web, uh, especially like for front end and 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 back end, I'll I think it might be even better than than for I guess just because of the pure statistics, right? Like there there has been historically more people developing web than 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 machine learning. So there, I think it really shines bright. Um, on some other problems, um, especially I don't know when you're dealing maybe with something that's very nitty gritty, uh, like in the sense of uh, algorithmically complex. Sometimes it struggles. Um, so yeah, it depends. Sometimes ten x definitely. Sometimes 10x like improvements in, in in iteration speed. I'm I'm interested in you know, also hearing your thoughts on like the concept of technical depth of you know as you are now you know creating your own products and you, I guess this is something you have to think about also like where do we want to invest our time uh, how mm -hmm. are we building uh, you know uh, expanding and so on and taking on sort of especially using machine learning thinking about okay we want to make sure that what we're building won't take up ex amount of resources moving forward. How do you sort of think about that? Are you try? obviously we are pro machine learning, right? But do you see any uh, like negatives in general of using machine learning or so on? Like, or how do you view that? Um, okay, I guess those are a couple of questions. Maybe starting from the machine learning side uh, for my product, because of the very nature of it, machine learning is definitely the only way to do it yeah it's not yeah, like sure. it's not you're building i don't know like you're trying to read <laughs> files from a file system and then you yeah. start using gpt4 to do that i don't, <laughs> like there are people who, who who use heavy weaponry on on very easy tasks and that's probably a mistake for for like i, I like the, the types of problems we are tackling they are a supernatural fit for machine learning so so i think i think uh, we are good there for the prioritization question you asked um i really it's a it's dark magic, right? Like it's 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 a, some set of implicit heuristics I'm using, um, oftentimes unconsciously, some oftentimes consciously as well. Um, but I try and think of the end user, uh, like what will they see? If, like if if I spend the whole day of doing this, what will the end user actually see? But it's it's not that simple, right? Because like if you take some time and and like not do something directly, but then you can build off of that, and that that kind of speeds you up over the long run, then again, that's probably a valuable investment. But there are all of these things you kind of have to juggle to choose, hey, so because now we only have a, a couple of people on the team, there is so many things I could do. I could be working on our data pipeline. I could be working on the front end. I could be working on the back end. I could be working on um, some side tools we, we have. So there is, you know, I could be working on, on marketing. I could be thinking VCs, although I'm doing that way less. 
I, I, I mostly get inbound interest. I think so far over 50 requests is just crazy. Again, just because of the community and, and, and like the previous track record. So I don't really, like I, I mostly just say, hey, we're currently really in a focus mode. I'm not trying to raise. Uh, and uh, and that time will come, I think very soon, but for now we just want to figure out um, what, what we really want to build. Um, and so, yeah, so all of these things have to be kind of uh, juggled uh, to, and, and there is no one correct answer of how I would be, I should be spending my time. Sometimes right now, like I'm, I'm doing this podcast. So like, I, I kind of decided that every Friday, like going forward, I'll try and do some type of, of like, um, like social media presence or whatnot, just to hear interesting ideas. You need that type of randomness. If you're too close and just doing technical stuff, like you, you, you miss out on a lot of interesting, potential interesting conversations and meeting interesting people like yourself. And, and also just, and you know this very well as well, I guess. YouTube offered me so many opportunities because when you put yourself out there and you and you help others, a lot of people will reach out. And so there is there is a set of unknown unknowns and, and opportunities that I will get if I do this. So it, it kind of that's how I justify me doing um, such su such a thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. To me, I like to me, I just uh, I haven't been doing that many of these podcasts, but. One thing that I really want to try to do more is uh, just getting more familiar with the uh, community and just, mm -hmm. you know, building a stronger community. Like the machine learning community is not, I wouldn't say it's that big and we can definitely become more powerful together by, you know, like building these relationships with each other and just finding ways in the future of collaborating uh, yeah. and just, to me, I, you know, that's just a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, like hundred percent, hundred percent. By the way, you, you said machine learning community is not that big. It, it depends how you define a machine learning community. If, if it's a research community, then yeah, it, it's still fairly smaller community, but like given that everybody's in AI nowadays, that means yeah. pretty much everybody became an ML community. It just depends on the level of abstraction where you want to be with your community. Like for me, I was always, I did, I never felt comfortable being super, super high level because I feel that somebody who is even in high school or, or beginning of their faculty days, they could be doing a great job teaching some of those basic, basic stuff. And so I kind of niche down into more papers because I, I also want to learn. So again, selfish reasons on, on my own and then teach others. So there is, so, so for me, that's why I kind of picked more of like, yeah um researcher type of of uh communities then rather than just like a global general audience um and I, I know that by doing that like i'm sacrificing my views i'm sacrificing the subs but i never i really never consider myself a youtuber for me this is just like one of the outlets i have to talk with people and like it's just one of the additional platforms i have i also use i'm fairly bullish on linkedin and on twitter as well twitter is where magic happens as you know for machine learning so so yeah I'm just rambling at this point. <laughs> nah, Please stop great, me. great thoughts, man. I, like, uh, I would, um, let's see, like, mm, I lost my train of thought. What, what was it you were saying? Because I, there was something that I wanted to add on that. I, I think, I think I also lost because I started rambling. <laughs> uh, basically, yeah, I, I was talking about the whole uh, YouTube stuff, and and um, you mentioned that you're you want to connect with other creators as well, and oh yeah, I, yeah okay, I, yeah, I, I you're saying. Think you were saying uh, that you know you you're sacrificing views, not doing a more general types of videos. Yeah. You know that to me has been something that has been on my mind. Like I, I saw like I've always been doing more research and implementations and stuff like that because that's what I've been interested in, and that is what I'm. You know, I like to develop my skills. I like to share what I've learned. See if other people can do that. And lately, I've been more interested. Also, like okay, can I expand and do certain? Like, can I try out do other types of videos? And that's good experimentation, but to me, yeah. actually, like to me, I think it becomes a problem when you don't think, uh, when you don't find that, like you should just do what you're curious about and what you think is fun. And so mm -hmm. to me, learning and building stuff is what's fun and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, implementing uh, stuff, reading papers, getting new ideas, those sort of mm -hmm. aha moments you get reading some papers, it's just like mind blown. And, uh, you know, that's what I think is fun. So. To me, I agree with you, like hundred percent. But then I also understand folks who are bigger creators who go more like mainstream and do stuff that's more superficial. Like not everybody has same objective functions. Like at one point of time, you start being less about, hey, what will I learn by doing this video, and more about like, will this improve my subscriptions? 
does my revenue because I'm treating this as a business. And I'm also yeah. helping those people. But like, I, I, I do think that a lot of those big creators are just like, they had to go over some of their internal principles, like including thumbnails and stuff. And and um, I, I think that the guy from Veritasium had, had a video where he literally said, hey, I apologize in front, but like, I'm going to start using more clickbaity thumbnails just because YouTube seems to be um, preferring those. And so I think you have to, as a big creator, you have to make all of these sacrifices. And I never, that's why I never really, really pushed to, to become like, to optimize for the subs and, and all of that, because it just, mm. I don't think A, it's going to be, it's going to have the most impact on me. And, and secondly, I, like I, I do want to stay true to some of the principles I, I hold and, and doing super superficial stuff and just like trendy stuff. Like it's not, I don't know, currently it's not for me. I'm not saying it's bad, uh, but like, I don't know. You I mean, what you have been doing has decisions. been working really well. <laughs> like you have, um, like, yeah, like the followers on LinkedIn. What do you think, by the way, of the different platforms? Like, how do you view YouTube, yeah. LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter? Yeah, and we, by the way, just a small digression. We keep on uh, mentioning like the subscriptions and numbers, but it's also yeah. like for me, it's, it's the quality of the audience. Like for having forty thousand on on like YouTube versus having four hundred thousand. For me, if I among those. Four, uh, like 40,000, and I know this for sure, I have so many smart PhD folks and professors and entrepreneurs leading some of the best tech companies in the world, like literally so many successful people that reached out to me later, like by DMs or whatnot. So I, I definitely prefer having like 10 multi-billionaires or 10 super successful AI tech startup owners or or 10 best researchers in the world following me among my, my, my 10,000 subscriptions than having a million where it's just mostly high school kids or, or students like which is just my preference i'm not saying they are less like less important demographics but like i i prefer having this more technical like highly skilled network than than building building that as opposed to just building numbers not caring where those numbers are coming from so i'm, I'm kind of i'm focused on a particular demographic and i i, I know what my audience is and so that, that's what i'm what i'm trying to do as to your question for LinkedIn and, and Twitter and all of these other platforms, um, I don't know. All of these have, have pros and cons. Um, like, I actually watched your video on the, uh, on, I skimmed it, on the, on, the, on the Twitter, like just recommending uh, profiles on Twitter. Like, I think yep. Twitter is definitely the best place for, for keeping up to date with, with, with research, with, um, with anything happening in machine learning. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is more... Um, the, the, the thing with LinkedIn is I got way more opportunities through LinkedIn, but like the community there is way less educated. And that's the reason why you have all of those trending posts from guys who don't really know anything about AI and very super, superficial posts. Although Twitter is not, is not like immune to those as well, but I think it kind of happens more on LinkedIn. Uh, there are more of these AI gurus, AI guys on LinkedIn where they really, they really are not nowhere near being experts in AI. Like, so um, and, and the audience is less educated in that sense, I think, than, than Twitter. Um, but it has its pros and cons. It's just different different demographics. So again, like a TLDR, TLDR would be, I get more opportunities, including like VCs and just offers, job offers and stuff on LinkedIn. The audience, I think organic reach is, is way better on, on LinkedIn. I get much more views and, 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 and reactions and everything on LinkedIn. But the audience itself is less like educated, like technical in that sense, not educated. Maybe that's not the right word to use. Then on Twitter, it's way less opportunities. Rarely who DMs you. Sometimes they DM with DM you, and then it's a great opportunity. Sometimes um, it's harder to get viral on Twitter. So like it's less, it's it's much more saturated than LinkedIn, I would say. And um, but yeah, but you, you can get a, like a huge amount of knowledge on on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter, sorry. So I'm, I'm literally using Twitter oftentimes to just, well, that's my main source actually for finding interesting papers and, and stuff. So yeah, that's how I think about it. And then YouTube is even maybe even a step further from LinkedIn where it's like way more like very dispersed, very, uh, a lot of them are beginners and uh, it's easier to get views. Um, and you get, I guess, you don't get direct. Um, like offers, at least not through comments, but some of them might connect you, with you on, on some of the social platforms and then that's how you can get some opportunities. But yeah, that's how I think about it. Yeah, that's a, well, what a great dimensions. summary. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, I'm like, a, let's see, uh, we went to, 
uh, start to wrap up, but I have a few questions also about like, uh, let's see. Uh, so, so one thing we've talked about now is uh, sort of keeping up to date, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, using Twitter a lot and, you know, following the most important people, the re doing research and so on. Are there other tools you use, uh, like, to find and follow papers of, like, recently released ones or, or do you mostly, like, Twitter-based? A couple more, but not that many. Like, I, I do use, like, GitHub trending page to find interesting projects. I do use papers uh, with code uh, to, to see some of the most interesting papers if I missed on any of them. Um, and then there is this bleeding bleeding AI or something like website where they, they are like very, very low frequency, but they kind of log all of the most interesting events in AI. But the thing is I, I almost always like see those before I see them on, on their website. So because of that, it's not really that useful. I think Twitter is just like a hive mind. It's, there is so many interesting people. And and like, if you find a way to filter out information there, you don't need anything else really. Because all of the best researchers and engineers and, and like tech folks, everybody's there. So, and they're all self-promoting and sharing and bringing some insightful uh, stuff on the table. So yeah. Uh, and to sort of uh, looking at how you've been learning, uh, would you say like mostly from courses, uh, like have you used any books uh, or like mostly papers and just thinking like for people that are interested in learning, what would you say is like the, the go-to methods mm -hmm. uh, for, for just developing your skill? Yeah, so, so I've been using different resources i've been in the field since 2018 let's say and end of 2018 and since then yeah i've done courses uh, like Andrang. i maybe skimmed through fast ai a little bit uh, i've done a bunch of books um papers a lot of papers i mean i, I covered only on my on my channel i think at least 100 papers in depth so and I, i've read at least forex that if, if not much more i i, I don't know but um yeah, it's kind of a combination of doing everything, like reading blogs, reading insightful blogs, uh, watching YouTube videos as well. All of that combined uh, helped me learn stuff and also just doing thinking of your own, building projects. That's super important. Like you have to build stuff and see how it looks like because that was in, in the detail, as they say. And um, as for a, like a structured curriculum, I think I literally left a blueprint of how I've done stuff and how I learned the job at DeepMind. Uh, I have a bunch of blogs on how to get started with machine learning. I do try and keep up to date. I keep I keep that block updated. Um, so that's probably a good resource to check out on Medium, how to get started with machine learning, or or the blog on how I landed the job at DeepMind, where I just link previous parts of my journey where I was doing exploration of like neural style transfer, deep dream algorithm, and then uh, GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, and then graph neural networks and transformers and RL and all of those goodies. So I kind of documented documented a lot of those things um, back then. Although I think the landscape changed a lot, so I would not recommend somebody now going through those. I think you should focus probably much more on prompting, um, understanding vector databases, understanding transformers. You don't really need to know anything about RNNs or LSTMs or any of those, unless you want to go a bit more deeply into research and you're trying to reconstruct some state-of-the-art stuff. Like you really don't need that. Well, again, depends on the, I'm, I'm biased, but like if you're trying to do something with language or, or, or vision for most of those, like you, you can just omit a lot of the step, you can just skip a lot of the steps I've done uh, when I was starting back in, in 2018, 2019. Just overview too, like you have like, uh going to like doing your own path versus taking a master's degree what would you say there like should this is a difficult question right this is, these are in the, it's very nuanced it depends a lot on the individual it, it depends a lot of the situation but just curious to get your thoughts for people that are like i know there's a lot of people that are i guess in a similar situation you were in uh sort of thinking all right what what should my path be f to learn uh and it can probably you know feel very daunting to like okay I'll, I'll skip doing this degree on my at my university and i'll start doing these online courses right <laughs> and just on my own kind of 
uh, like that, that is a very challenging like step. Like, uh, what, what would be your perspective on that for, for people that are in that situation? Like the, the most important part here is again, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to self-awareness. Like if you, if you're, so there is a spectrum, right? Like there is a spectrum where on one end of the spectrum, you're super, super self-driven, super self-disciplined, you know what you want. Then it's obvious you want to go your own path. Like let, let the faculty be, there, there is no way that when somebody creates a curriculum for you, that's generic for many people, that that's going to be the, the best one for you, for you personally. So in that case, I, I think you strongly think you should go your, your own, your own path, unless you get an opportunity to work with some of the, like maybe some of the best professor in the world uh, for some of, for some specific machine learning topic that you deeply care about. And when I say the best, that doesn't mean the most popular one, just the one that works the best for you. And that's very right. Like that's, that's very subjective. And then on the other hand side, if you, if you know you need structure, you cannot self-discipline yourself. You historically didn't have the strength of doing projects on your, on your own, then definitely just go and, and enroll in some type of like structured curriculum, either like a boot camp or faculty or whatnot. If you're somewhere in the middle, and I guess most people will be here, and that's the most interesting part. And, and it's hard, right? You probably, if, if, you, if you don't fully believe you can do it on your own, you can just do it in parallel. That's probably the safest bet. Go and do your, your, your studies and you will definitely have enough time to do your own projects and exploration on the side and then decide how that thing is going. Like if you see that some project is picking up, it's grabbing your attention, you're learning more in your free hours than you're learning during your studies. If that starts happening, and that was definitely happening for me, uh, then like, well, it's still a decision. It's a big decision. Maybe if you think that that credential is going to give you some type of an edge, uh, then just um, wrap it up. Don't, 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 don't give up. Don't, don't drop out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very subjective. It depends really on, on, on a lot of factors. That's yeah. kind of how I yep. think about it. That's my framework for thinking about this. <laughs> I, I've been in a similar situation, so like I'll share what I, for me that mm -hmm. I was learning a lot more doing my own thing. But there was this uh, feeling of, you know, a lot of companies look. Do you have a master's degree? Uh, that's a really important part for many hiring decisions. Okay. Well, I guess. Uh, well, all right. This is what I've uh, I've heard. <laughs> like to me, it seems like uh, if if you have a master's degree, you're in a better position, unless you have what you have, which is really strong documentation of your skill. Uh, so like if you don't have, if you have a strong documentation of your GitHub, YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, in your case, LinkedIn and all of these things, like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. But if you are, uh, if you don't have that, and maybe you're just someone that has taken courses, you haven't really been documenting things, then having that merit of like, yeah, I've taken this challenging degree, is something that can you know yeah. make a big difference you just have to think about one thing like the thing is there is so many people that have master's degree so what makes you different and also i think for for the best tech companies out there that's when, why i said do they care like for the best companies out there and even they don't have to be the best they can they can just be like a very modern like tech startup most of them just care whether you can get shit done like they don't really care about your master's degree because you probably didn't come from Stanford. You just came from some, some like, I mean, uh, you just came from some random country and, and those people from that startup that you're trying to apply for don't even know anything about that country or, or they don't know how valuable that master's degree is. Not all, not, not all master's degrees are made equal, right? And so that, that's the issue. So I think if you can wrap up only your bachelor and you have one amazing project on GitHub that's very relevant to the company you're applying for, you're in a much better position than somebody who has master's degree and zero other, like otherwise zero public artifacts about their skill. So yeah, that's why I think it, it's very, it depends. Like it depends on the faculty, yeah. it depends on, 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 you know, so it, that's why it's complicated. Yeah, I completely agree. Like for me, I would say that I learned more doing my own thing, but I was sort of, I, uh, one thing that is also challenging that you need to deal with when taking your own path is, sort of uh, you're creating your own like you don't have a structured sense of belonging like you do if you go to a university you already mm -hmm. you you have people studying with you you have all of this structure around you if you're doing your own thing you have to deal with that uh as well 
which That's can true. be challenging. Uh, it was challenging for me. And so I, you know, I, I, uh, it also, it depends on the situation. Like I know, uh, you're familiar with Daniel Bork, for example, like he took mm -hmm. his own as well. Uh, but like for me in Sweden, you are actually like, you get paid for going to university. Like it's not, you don't even have to pay. Uh, mm -hmm. so to me, that was my thing that, you know, well, I'm in this situation where it's like, you have all these incentives to, to do your master's degree. I, I, why, like I'm, I, if I'm in this like privileged situation, I should be doing it. But looking back, I, this is so hard because like, you can, it's easy looking back, but I think yeah. if I would have just been able to deal with more uncertainty and just do my own thing, I would have developed faster. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, a master's degree is like two years and that's like nothing. Yeah. Uh, so well, in the grand scheme of... It's not nothing. I, I, I think two years when you're in your 20s is much more than two years when you're in your like, like when you have 12 or when you're 40, 50. I think two years in these, in these, like in this period of life can like take you on a completely different path, right? Because things you do early in your career, you're closer to the, to the root of the, of the tree, right? And then you will never know the hypothetical futures that you can, you could have gone through. And so mm. you have to be really very, very careful and deliberate when you choose. I'm not, I'm not saying it's like a terminal or bad decision, whatever you've done. Like if you're, if you're still 23, four or five, even 30, whatever, 35, you still have options, but it, it's a matter of like, it's a quantitative matter. Like if you, if you simply had two years more of doing like work on your own that you know was relevant, that's a huge advantage to somebody who didn't have that, right? Like you're, you're just at, at an advantage there. So it's not the end of the world, but like decisions matter a lot in these, in, when you're, when you're young, like, so, so, I, so I think that's something yeah. to, to keep in mind. I, I want to balance this discussion too, of like uh -huh. trying to be really efficient, trying to be productive with, you know, maybe a more uh, Huberman perspective, which is more, you know, health, uh, you know, of how do you get uh, like well being and balancing all of these like ambitious goals. Uh, what have you learned from Huberman? Like, uh, what try to what practices do you have? Uh, like, like do you have habits you're trying mm -hmm. to do, routines and so on that really try to because you want to have longevity in this too. Like, you can't just be stressed about being ambitious and productive yeah. all the time. That's true. That's true. So for me, Huberman had a huge impact, definitely. The thing is, I already, when I started watching him, I already had a lot of the structure in my life already, a lot of the previous track records with with workouts, with, with a lot of experimentation with nutrition and stuff. So I was in a probably different position uh, than, than most people will be. Uh, but um, some of the things he definitely um, uh, like helped me implement in my life. One of them is cold showers. That was super important and like because i was traveling around japan after i left DeepMind, i kind of stopped doing it the water was not that cold in japan in london it was super cold it was like it was winter and it was maybe 10 to 15 degrees like i, I was like literally red red when i go out of the shower and and that helped me the, the thing i'm not even looking at cold showers from the standpoint of being physically more like uh like stronger or whatnot the thing with cold showers is the thing i noticed it helps you deal with stress better that's the main thing for me. Like when you manage to be under su such a cold water, like either immersed or under shower, and you manage not to tremble, you just like keep your posture, you're calm, you know how to breathe well, that same type of practice can help you uh, endure other stressful situations, like maybe giving a public speech or whatnot. Like you're much better composed when you do that. So I think for me, that was that's probably one of the main tools that, that like I currently have in my toolkit. And I, I'm going to start actually using trying. I'm, I'm trying to get to the um, to, immer to to go the the full immersion instead of doing the showers. But the problem with that is I'm not in a cold country, so I I'd have to buy yeah. ice and stuff. So I'm still th yeah. thinking of how I can figure out those details. But I think especially now yeah. during summer, I have to figure it out. So that's you, one thing. You should come visit Sweden during winter. Yeah, hundred percent. You you guys are <laughs> that's different. You you have natural. You can just jump in in like uh in in, in water and 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 you're good. Um, and, and, and then what else? Um, I started, I respect sleep much more. Like historically, I was always very, very consistent with my sleep. So this just kind of reinforced the fact that you have to have some type of sleep consistency. 
the, the, the exact moment when you go to bed is probably not as relevant. Like for me, for example, since I arrived from Japan, I was going to bed super late, like 4 a.m. late, 3 a.m. late, constantly, every day. And I, I feel very, very well rested when I wake up because I'm just consistently going to the bed at that same point of time. And also, I, I, I had the privilege of talking with Demis Kasabis, the CEO of, of DeepMind, and I asked him the same question. And, and his rhythm is actually the same. He goes to sleep 4 a.m., he wakes up 10 a.m. Every, every day. And he's been doing that, as if I recall, recall correctly, for like seven years. And also, one of the podcasts I watched with Huberman, um, I think it was Gina was the name of the woman. She she said the same thing. Like, we don't have any strong research telling you when you have to go to bed. As long, But the consistency matters. Because if you miss that regular sleeping, bed, that bedtime, you kind of miss on the human growth hormone, uh, like, um, secretion that's kind of, higher at that at that point of uh, of the sleep cycle so that's the second uh big thing sleep uh, i mentioned uh i mentioned the, the cold exposure i always have some type of workout like i go running i do calisthenics i'm i'm, I'm bullish on calisthenics i do like handstands and, and like uh, pull-ups push-ups all of that uh less of gym because when i'm working constantly like i'm currently in startup like crunch mode working the whole day like it doesn't i don't feel well if i go in a closed space and and just do some weights there so i have yeah. to be outside um what else uh, i try and do some supplementation a bit less recently but like omega 3s um during the winter definitely i, I take the vitamin d um and uh, i started taking creatine after workouts since recently for the first time in my life but it didn't have any effect like I think I'm one of those uh, guys who who has enough like non-responders or just eating yeah or just eating too much meat or whatnot I don't know or maybe I just didn't I, I was not consistent enough I'm gonna start like drinking it every day after workout and see how it how it plays out um and uh, yeah I think those are some of the main things I do maybe maybe there are some more yeah to to add on that for me uh, one thing that uh, has I've noticed is I like to get completely absorbed in work for a while and then just my mind is uh basically that's the only thing i'm and you go like semi crazy during that time uh just being focused on that and then when sort of when you're done with your goal for that sort of time period or what you've been working on i like to just uh force myself to take uh, like a short just a few days and just do nothing and mm -hmm. during that time i just re like get re-energized and it's interesting like the motivation always comes back to you uh, nice. and, and it's like self-motivation is, it's kind of interesting when you find that you are that way, that, you know, you push yourself, you go, you go like semi crazy working on something, you take a break. And the only thing yeah. you're thinking about during that break is like, damn, I want to do this. I want to do this, you know? And then yeah. it, when you force yourself, like, no, I'm still not going to do anything. Then you're like, the, the energy just comes back to you. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just ba That's balancing. That's a good practice. That's a good practice. I think a lot of people do some form of that. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a like a three days or whatnot. It can be even. I think you you need to have some such activity during every day. Like you have yeah. to have that type of like. Is it called from this learning how to learn course? Like there is the the focus mode and there is the diffuse. Diff, like let's call it diffuse yeah. mode. So like yeah. during diffuse mode, like you you take a shower or it, it's it's not like a coincidence that historically people during during hot showers or saunas or whatnot came up with ideas or while they were resting on the beach. It's just how our brain works. Because in the background, it's not like the process stops just because you don't have any conscious thought. So a lot of connections are being made in the background and we're just chill. You allow your brain to create these unusual connections and then eureka moment, the the, the epiphany, <laughs> no pun intended, um, appears to you. So that's definitely super important. Um, for me, I, I, I travel every now and then. Uh, I noticed, the thing with traveling, it, it, it breaks your habits. It's very hard to stay in a very rigorous um, uh, regime if you travel. So I'm, I'm definitely deprioritizing traveling for the for the months to come. But like I've been to Paris a couple of days ago. I had some VC dinner invite there, and I've been there with my girlfriend. It was my birthday as well, so we spent like four days. And like I was also working, but less less work and and some exploration of the city. So that kind of helped me maybe. Um, relax a bit from the previous 25 plus days where i was literally 15 hour days every day yeah, from yeah. 10 a.m through like 2 3 a.m i was not stopping it's just huge huge amount of work and concentration like yeah 
last thing I want to ask, you know, uh, what is your advice to, to people who are interested in building a successful machine learning career? What, uh, what would you say are like the most important things they should try to focus on? Mm. But the, the, the first question I'd have to ask you is, do you want to be a researcher or an engineer? Because the paths differ a lot, I think. Uh, okay, like, uh, uh, let's say they want to, you know, go a similar path as, as you with uh, trying mm -hmm. to build innovative projects and entrepreneurial uh, mm -hmm. companies and so on. Okay, so if you're trying to be a bit more, if you know that your end goal will not is not to be like a prestigious researcher with a high age index, if that's not your goal, if your goal is to be uh, later in your life entrepreneur, then you want to be more of a generalist. You don't you don't want to dig too deep into one topic and just like do that for seven years and miss out on everything else. There are some examples you, you might like. There is this usual saying where they where they tell you you want to have a, like a T shaped curve. You want to be like a super, like a huge expert in one particular topic. And then you want to be general and, and like knowledgeable across different areas. That, that that's probably works uh, for, for um, I guess, for, um, for some people. For me, I think I have a, a bit more of those like um, deeper parts, so to speak. But it's not as deep as somebody who's done a PhD and postdoc and spent then four years in like a AI research lab. Uh, so it's always going to be a trade-off between like breadth for search or and depth for search to use some nerdy terms. Um, so for me, again, uh, if you want to go uh, the entrepreneurial way one day, uh, you should probably learn also how to use social media. Uh, you should try and uh, build your own brand. Uh, you should uh, build stuff, but also read stuff. Uh, you should attack different areas of machine learning, not just converge to a single one. That, that's one of this approach I took. That doesn't mean that's the right approach. Even if you have the same ambition and goal as I do, that doesn't mean that's the only way to 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 go there. But it's it's a way. It's one way that that you can uh, go about it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a TLDR. Awesome, man. Man, I really uh, enjoyed this conversation with you. It was a really uh, you know I think what you're doing is amazing, and you know it's, it'll be really interesting to follow your your journey forward as well. And just take inspiration from from you know what you're doing and uh yeah man i uh thanks yeah. a lot man i appreciate it and i really love your questions like you 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 you, you have some very interesting questions and i really enjoyed the, the the discussion with you awesome man all right talk to you soon cheers